So for all of you who are coming to church for the message that God will never let you down. Peter wanted me to tell you. Sometimes he does a little bit. Because see, you keep basing it on your expectation and calling it faith. You, um, you customized the Bible to the parts that made you feel good and cut out all the parts where they fished and caught nothing. Like What I love about this message, what I really love about this message, if you want to know what I really love about this message, it can apply to the capital L letdown or the lowercase l letdown. Capital L letdown. Jesus went to the cross and died. That's about as bad as it gets. The guy that you left everything to follow dies. And he's supposed to overthrow Rome and get the oppression out of the. Yeah, he's supposed to. Yeah, but he doesn't. He dies. That's pretty bad. That's what, I got to clarify. This is not. Man, I had really hoped they were going to do Amazing Grace at church today. This is not a. I really hope. This is a. I risked everything. Now, some people are not disappointed in God because they never really hoped in Him to begin with. Peter was the leader. When he said, I'm fishing, they said, we're fishing too. When he jumped out the boat, they were like, come on, let's go to the shore. Peter's going to the shore. They were following Peter more than they were following Jesus at that point. And the one with the greatest potential also experienced the greatest pain. Now, that's a word for somebody. The more you hope and trust in God, the greater vulnerability there will be for those moments in your life where the enemy whispers, God is not with you. For those low moments. Who's been in a low moment lately? He's the Lord of those low moments. I know everybody tells you he's the resurrected Christ, and he is. But before he got up, he was laid down. See how this is cyclical? See how when Peter says, I will let down the nets. That wasn't the, le- the last letdown in the scripture. If only that were the last letdown. If only Jesus didn't let Lazarus die. See, they've had practice for this. <laughs> the, and so have you. You have had practice to know that what you're going through right now, that you don't think you're going to make it through, you thought you wouldn't make it through the last thing that you were going through, that you thought you wouldn't make it through, and you made it through that. And so even you being here today. Is evidence of the fact that life will let you down. People will let you down. That, that's what I told Elijah the other day. I said, Being a dad is my greatest privilege, uh, next to being Holly's husband. <laughs> next to that, that's, like the, that's the main thing in my life because even me being a dad, I, I wouldn't be able to do it without her. I mean, she's the only thing that makes me look good most days anyway. But being a dad is amazing. But I'm disappointed in being a dad from this perspective. Not because of you, not because of you, not because of you. You surprise me every day in good ways. No, I love it. I really love it. I really love it. I I really love it. I love being a dad. But it's almost like when I thought of myself as a dad, I thought of myself like I would be coaching the players in a game, and I would be on the sidelines calling the plays, telling them how to follow God and telling them how to be disciplined and teaching them in the ways that they should go and training up a child. But in my picture of being a dad, I was doing all of this from the sidelines of parenthood. Nobody told me that they leave you in the game to get hit while you try to coach this team that is running down the field in the wrong direction. Nobody told me you don't get to take off the pads to be a parent. You still are getting hit. You're still dealing with whatever you brought into parenthood. There was no wand. In fact, is there any couple in the room that has been married for a year or less? A year, you got that newlywed, 
Holy Ghost love. Stand up right now. Stand up right now. Oh, let's give him a hand, y'all. Let's give him a hand. Let's give him a hand for absolutely nothing. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Oh, that's wonderful. Did you do the marriage vows? Did you write your own vows? Did you write your own vows? Did you put this part in? Look at each other right now. I'm going to do it real quick. I'm going to do it real quick. I'm ordained. I'm ordained. I'm, I'm ordained. I'm ordained. It's okay. I'm, I'm ordained. Say, I will let you down. Now sit down. I, I, I bet you didn't put it in. You didn't know to put it in. So what you have in your relationship will not be known until after 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 I thought I'd be an amazing parent because I thought I would have a box in the sky and a headset to call the plays they would give to the quarterback. I didn't know I'd be out here getting hit too. I didn't know that I would let them down. Because the biggest thing in the passage to preach about isn't that Jesus let Peter down, because he got up, and he walked in locked doors to show Peter, I told you, I told you. He walked through locked doors to show Thomas, I died for you. But now this is the third appearance. And it seems that Jesus is no longer dealing with the fact that he let Peter down. Seems like now he's trying to deal with the fact that Peter let him down and denied that he even knew Jesus. And that's what Peter had to move through. He could get through the fact that it didn't end like I wanted because he saw the resurrected Christ. But John 21 is added in the Bible, help me Holy Spirit, to show you that God knew the ways that you would let him down before he ever called your name to follow him. And if Jesus had gone back up to heaven before John 21, Peter could not have preached on the day of Pentecost. He was no longer living in the letdown of what Jesus didn't do. He was living in the letdown of what he didn't do for Jesus. And that is why it was important for Jesus to take time to cook breakfast for these disciples who denied him. Even the ones who didn't deny him, they disassociated from him. Even the ones who said, I will follow you to death. Even loud mouthed Peter, who was willing to cut off an ear in the garden so that no no one would take his Lord away. Even Peter, who was willing to give Jesus his boat, not even knowing yet where this journey would lead. Even Peter, in the moment of crisis, he let him down. That's what I'm upset about. Not that God let me down. If I'm honest, the biggest thing I have to process is that I constantly feel like I'm letting him down. That's why I go back fishing, doing what I know to do, because I don't want to let you down. God, I'm sorry. I'm here again. Here I am struggling with this again. I've already had help with this. I've already prayed about this. You already taught me about this. I memorized scripture, and here I am again. I let you down. I let you down. God said, really? I wasn't aware that you were holding me up. That's why he got up out of the grave. Not only holding his own, not only, he wasn't holding anything but the keys to death, hell, and the grave. All of your sin, all of your shame, all of the record, all of the guilty stain, it was in the grave that he left. The only thing he was holding was the keys to let you know, Peter, <laughs> that you can't let me down. Because to disappoint God 
would mean that you had something deep down inside that he didn't see. And since God is this thing called omniscient, which means all knowing, and since he is all seeing, and since he fills everything in every space, even the spaces in between the things you show him, even the spaces between Sundays where you struggle, even the spaces in between your great bursts of faith, since he fills that space, he came to the shore to show you something that I want you to get the revelation for today. Not just that he got up. He got up. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Not unless you believe that you can too. You've got to get up. You must get up. Your purpose demands it. Your faith commends it. You must get up. You must get up. You, this is not a suggestion. It's a command. If you got if you got to jump in the water, you must get up. You must get up. It's a summons to faith. You must get up. Because there is life after the letdown. There is life after the letdown. And confess it by faith with your own mouth. There is life after the letdown. Yeah, this didn't turn out how I wanted, but I'm going forward by faith because there is life after the letdown. A lot of people left me. They left Jesus too. He called them friends. He didn't get bitter. He fed them breakfast because there is life after the letdown. That lets me know he can forgive any dirty, rotten, stinking, sinful thing I do. How do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know he can still use me? How do you know God's not disappointed in me? How do you know he hasn't changed his mind? How do you know I didn't blow it? How do you know the best days aren't behind me? How do you know I didn't make a mistake I can't come back from? How do I know it? Because the fish told me so. Not the ones Peter caught. The ones that Jesus was already cooking when he got to the shore. See. He's not finished with you yet. That's why you didn't die yet. That's why some of you made a plan to kill yourself, but you couldn't. That was the grace of God to hold you up. So he won't let you down that far. No, no, no. That's where my solid rock kicks in. He's got a purpose for me. He's got something to build through my life. Hey, thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this video with a friend. And don't forget, you can join me live every Sunday. Thanks again for watching.